G'day everyone. So today I'm going to be doing some work on the mill. I'm going to show you how I rebore wheels to fit on bigger hubs. So this is where having a Bridgeport style mill comes in handy because you can fit really big stuff on it compared to the footprint that it takes up. So first thing I'm going to do is we're going to bolt these down face down. I'm going to put some masking tape to try and protect them as much as possible. So now that the wheel's on the table, we've got to hold it down. These slots here are like a T-shape, like there's a lip on the inside. So I've got a little clamp kit here. You buy these in like a set, and there's a bunch of different size ones. But basically, these are T-slot nuts. You get the length stud that you need. They're all like the super long ones and short ones, and you pick out the size that you need. That slides in under the T-slot. And you get one of the clamps. It slides down. The little teeth match up on that and now I can bolt this down and it holds the wheel down to the table as tight as I need it so I'll put a, another couple around it and then we're ready to start machining. So I realized I was covering most of that with my hand but there it is you can see there's little teeth for the height you want it to sit. The clamp always has to be angled towards the workpiece because if the clamp was angled up like if I put it too low down here when you tighten it it wants to squeeze the wheel out and it's sort of slipping on this outside edge whereas when it's up it can get a good firm bite on something and it's not going to want to squeeze and shoot it out the other side. So this is the boring head fitted up in the mill now. This is just like a cheap one off eBay that I bought a while ago. So far it's done really well for me. I think it was like two or three hundred dollars and a good brand one is like two thousand dollars. I don't know it's such a massive jump. The only problem with it is, uh, the way it works is obviously this spins around and you can see this cutter goes around and will bore out the size hole you want. Then to adjust the size of it, you turn this adjustment here and it will move the cutter in either direction. Normally, each one of these little divisions on here would be 0.1 of a millimeter. This one is in, it's not a standard measurement. It's like the old Imperial American system. So it's really annoying having to convert backwards and forwards constantly. It'd be nice if it was just in standard instead of Imperial, but it's still usable. So all we've got to do now is get the center of this over the center of the hub of the wheel so we can start boring it. So normally I do this, I get it close by eye. Ugh, my hand's in the way. So we'll bring the boring head down close to where we're working, which you can't see again. I can see straight away there's a big gap here. When I'm on this side, it's it's way too far. So we'll start by getting it close by eye. So you can see our head now is pretty much tracing that inside circle bang on. So that's about as close as you'll get it just by looking at it. So now I'm going to hook up or attach a dial indicator to it and we'll use the dial indicator to find set the center position. So this is the dial indicator here. Basically, it looks like a little watch I guess. And it's got this little arm on the end of it. And when this little arm moves up and down, you can see it reads on the dial. So every division on this is 0 0.01 of a millimeter. So I barely touch this little arm. And you can see the needle goes completely nuts. So we can use this to know exactly how close we are to stuff. So I'll attach it to this with a magnet and we'll run it around the inside and see how far off we were by eyeing it. This is a magnetic dial indicator base. You can see it's got a switch here to turn the magnet on and off. So this is now stuck to the dividing head. And I loosen this knob, everything goes all loose. And then wherever I put it, I tighten the knob and it stays in that position. So we gotta get, this is a bit awkward, I can't really video it, but I gotta get the dial indicator down and into this hole. Once it's locked in, I'll show you how we clock it up. Okay, so this is very hard to get the camera in to see, but if it was in focus, the little end of the dial indicator is now running around the inside of this hub. So basically what I can do is I'll bring it round to this side so it's off by 90 degrees. It's very bright. I'll actually turn this light off. Now it's too dark. So it's round here, in by 90 degrees. I can turn a little knob on the top here to adjust it to zero. And then now that it's on zero, I can drag it all the way around opposite and you can see that the dial's moving. So the opposite side, now that we're over there, we've gone from 0 to 0 0.3. 
So what I'm going to do now is we know this side of the hole is 0.3 off. So I'm going to wind the table, wind the whole wheel that direction 0.15 to split the difference. And the idea is we keep doing that 90, uh, 180 degrees from each other until the dial indicator reads zero all the way around. And then we know that the center of the spindle where the dial indicator is rotating is exactly the center of the wheel. All right, so now that I've gone adjusted a few times, you can see we're at the zero point here. And as we bring the dial indicator around, it stays on the zero. So you can see obviously every single little bump it goes over, it moves the needle around, but that's where we want it. So if it was varied from there just to this next division, that's only 0.1 of a millimeter. So the little variation that's in it is probably 0 0.01, 0 0.02 of a millimeter, which for a wheel hub is well more than enough accuracy. So I can pull the magnet off now, and then we know that when we cut down inside, we're exactly lined up with where the original bore was. So now that we're all set up on center, I'm going to set the speed and feed I'm going to be running. So depending on whether this is high or low gear, it changes the direction it runs. So I'll make sure it's going forwards, which it's not, that's backwards. So once we go in the right direction, you can see up here I've got two speeds, I've got low and high. So we're in high, so we're currently doing 900 RPM. The top of this machine is a CVT gearbox, so I can wind this up and down with just the speed I want. I think about 900, maybe it's slower, 800 is probably all right for this. The other thing we're gonna do, instead of me pulling this lever to bring it down, which isn't very smooth, like you'll see the jumpiness from me sliding it down myself, this machine has power feed. So this knob on the side here, you can see I've got 0 0.15, 0 0.04, and 0 0.08. So I'm gonna run it at 0 0.08, I think, so I'm gonna turn it off to change that. And basically, what that will do is it will feed it down automatically till it gets to a set stop. So, now we've got the power feed set to the speed we want. Instead of me pulling this, well, my arm's in the way, instead of me pulling this lever to go up and down, if I pull this now, you can see it starts to feed automatically until it gets to where I've wound this stop to. And once it gets there, it'll disengage the feed. And that's it. Now it's loose, it'll go back up. So. I can set the depth I want, and instead of trying to do it manually, it'll go down and then stop and I can retract it myself. So I've got my depth, my depth set, I've got the feed, the speed it feeds down at set, and I've got the RPM set. So all I'm going to do now is wind the cutter out till it's just going to take a really small cut, and we'll take our first pass and see how on target we've gotten. So about there, looks like it should contact. It's going to just take a skim off it. Tighten up these three here, which just lock it in place. And then we'll take a cut. So you can see it's just skimmed it. And once it gets to my set depth, it'll click and, reta and retract. There we go. So that looked like it took about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 off. Now I can confirm my center is set correctly because I can see it's just touched all the way around. So what I'll do now is measure this diameter and then let's say I need to go 5mm bigger. I'll have to convert 5mm to Imperial and then I can wind this out 5mm and it'll take 5mm off. Except not 5mm at once, probably take 2.5 and 2.5. So I'll measure it and then we'll start cutting. So before I've started measuring I've just decided to rough it out a bit more. Because I know that my diameter, you can see there's like a lip hanging over. The diameter I have to get to is that bottom diameter. So I can explain that better. So I'm just roughing it out a bit before I start measuring it. These lips hang out and I need to machine the whole thing to this bottom diameter. So I'm just taking off the bulk of the material before I start measuring it. All right, so I've just taken a few cuts by eye to get it about where I want to be. And I've got a little bit further to go, but now I've got to start measuring it. So, normally for something like this, you can just use the inside of the verniers, because this is what's accurate enough for this, but the verniers are actually too long to fit inside the wheel. So what I'm going to use is a telescopic gauge. This is slightly more accurate, and it's much better at getting in tight places. So basically, uh, where is it? they come in a set. You pick the, pick the size that you need. I need this one. 
you squeeze it, loosen the end, squeeze it closed, tighten it, and then when you undo the end, the ends pop out, if they're not, these ones are pretty old, they got old oil in them, but basically once you undo them, the ends pop out. <laughs> so these have been ground with like a bit of a dome on the end, so this can be hard to get the camera in there and my arm at the same time. So if you can see that, you put it in, you pop it open, and then you sort of tighten it up a little bit so there's some drag on them. Make sure it's sort of set to the right size, pull it out, and then once it's out, you can measure it with the inside of the vernies, which is a lot more accurate. So this is measuring 96.1, uh, 69.1, i got to go to 69.5. So I'm going to take another 0.4 off it, which will only be 0.2 on the dial, because remember I need to take 0.4 off diameter, which is only 0.2 off the radius. So I'll convert 0.2 into 0, 0, 0, 0.005 of an inch, and then we'll dial it in here. And hopefully we'll run one more cut and we should be bang on size. So I've worked out I need to go 12 marks on the thing here. So I re-measured this a few times and then took an, took an average on it. The dial, the, dial uh, the telescopic gauge is something you need to get a bit of a feel for. So it's always good to measure it a few times and see how consistent you are. And if you're consistent, you should be accurate. Consistency and accuracy is not the same thing. If you can measure it consistency, consistently, odds are you should be fairly accurate with it as well. So, fingers crossed, take this last cut, hopefully we end up at the right size. Cool. Well, that, that looked about right. We'll measure it and find out. Yeah, I'm just going to have to measure it with my arm in the way because it's, it's too hard to reach around from the other side. Here we go. Whoa, five, seven, five, six. So, awesome. <laughs> That's good. That's a relief. It's right. Um, we're 0 0.06 oversize. So, I measured the original ones. The original bore for this was supposed to be 66.9. And these original wheels when I measured them were actually 66.95, so the factory had given a 0.05mm clearance for this to fit over the centre hub, because if this was exactly 66.9 and the hub was 66.9, they don't actually fit over each other, because two things exactly the same size mean that the two outer surfaces of atoms technically have to occupy the same space, so they don't actually fit together. So factory specs about 0.05 clearance, I've got 0.06 clearance, that's pretty much as close as it's going to get 0.01 of a millimetre different. So that's good. I don't need to redo this chamfer because the factory one's still plenty of it there. So we'll get this wheel off and put the next one on. So just as I was saying that, it occurred to me that you don't need to see me put the next one on because it's four things exactly the same. So hopefully that was interesting. Uh, it's not really a how-to video for how to do something at home, but it is a how to do this video because normally you don't have this machinery at home. My job, like I'm a, my trade is a fitter machinist, which is doing jobs like this. So this machine, the mill and the lathe and the other stuff is something I wanted for like, since I was freaking five or something, wanting like machinery like this. So to even have it now and to be able to run it and in my own shed is really cool to be able to finally have all the space and this stuff. These sorts of machines, they do come up really cheap all the time. So you can keep an eye out. A lot of the time they're big and they're heavy and they're awkward to move. So people are happy to get rid of them. That's sort of where this one came from. It was uh, owned by an older, a friend's older relative that passed away and they're too big to move it and the thing weighs a ton and yeah, so you can get them. They're definitely not out of the question for a home shop. The mill is absolutely awesome. Anyway, I'm talking about too much stuff. These are sick. I love using them. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. Hopefully it was interesting and I'll see everybody on the next video. So goodbye. <laughs>